From Washington, Diplomacy and Global Affairs, in Conversations with Nicholas Kroll. On the program today, the German ambassador to the United States, Peter Amont. We have to rebuild trust. It's like in a marriage. Uh, the closer you are, the, the bigger the disappointment uh, if one of the partners fails on you. But both, both sides, uh, are, are, I think, are convinced that we have to rebuild trust and restore trust, and, and we are working on that. Amont, on Germany's diplomatic priorities in the United States and around the world, the recent revelations about American spying tactics, and the West's relationship with Russia. Stay tuned. Support for Conversations with Nicholas Krolov comes from these sponsors. And viewers like you. To contribute, visit nicholaskrolov.com. Thank you for joining us. Peter Amon is here. He has been Germany's ambassador to Washington since 2011. He joined the German Foreign Service in 1978 and has served in India, Senegal, Britain, and of course, many times in Berlin. His most recent foreign assignment was as ambassador to France. I'm pleased to have him at this table. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Nicholas. So let's begin with Germany's diplomatic priorities in the United States mm -hmm. currently, not just in Washington on the political side, but in anything else, economy, culture, other part of diplomacy, because diplomacy isn't just about political relationships. But what are the top two or three diplomatic priorities of Germany today? It's hard to pinpoint to a priority because um, Washington is the most important diplomatic post we have, so there are so many priorities. Let me start by uh, mentioning the political cooperation, which of course is, is very close, very intense. We are, made, uh, we are partners in NATO. Uh, we are working together with the White House, with the State Department every day on, on issues which are hot like Ukraine these days. Uh, but I would also like to mention the economic relationship, which is a, a very uh, f uh, productive relationship. We are proud to say that we have now 700,000 jobs in, in the US created from German investment. And of course, it's my job to, to support this, help German investors, encourage them, help them through the, through the, through the small things in life that have to be settled every day. And uh, I was gratified to learn the other, or hear another German CEO say the other day that 10 years ago he had to uh, present to his investors a China story, and now he has to present them with a US story. Why is that, do you think? You, you actually have a PhD in, e in economics. Yeah, economics is, my, is, is, yeah. Is, 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 is in the center of my attention, of my, uh, of my work. And uh, I believe that, uh, the, that the US has a fantastic uh, perspective, offers a, a fantastic perspective to investors, to, to, to companies. And uh, uh, we had a, a opinion poll among uh, the German companies who are uh, invested here in the US uh, at the beginning of the year. And it came out that their prediction for the year 2014 was 3% growth for, for the US as a whole, but 10% growth for the German companies in the US. So the, the German companies uh, who are producing cars in the southeast, you may have heard that BMW has become the largest exporter of American-made cars in the world. It's something most people don't, don't know uh, because uh, certain uh, brands of cars are made by German companies in the southeast uh, uh, for the world market. When you buy an X5 BMW in Beijing or in Munich, it will be made in South Carolina. So the, the question of how diplomacy helps business, I find very interesting because in just in the last several weeks, I've heard opinions, some stronger than, than other, that in democracies, in market economies, companies don't need diplomats mm -hmm. to help them in any way. Mm -hmm. Do you think they, I mean, you're helping, you're trying to help the German yeah. companies. Would they be fine without you? Uh, they would be fine uh, in, in America probably, uh, not, in, not in China, because you all know how, uh, uh, how much concern there is about the rules of the game in, in, in other countries. But still in America, I would say, there is a lot of regulation and uh, um, we, we have to set standards which are uh, compatible to each other. Uh, that's why I'm uh, a strong supporter of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. That's a free trade agreement and a free investment agreement which, are, which is negotiated right now. And it's not only that this agreement will bring 
hundreds of thousands of new jobs, both to the US and to Europe. But uh, it will help us to uh, uh, harmonize standards and make standards compatible. My example is always when the automobile was invented, you had to decide whether to drive on the left side of a road or on the right side of a road. And those of you who have been to, 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 to England, uh, to London, may have noticed you can drive on the left side of the road quite perfectly. But you have to decide on one standard. And, uh, and every day new inventions are, are made, uh, new technologies emerge, and standards are set. And it's important that we produce standards that are compatible. Because you can drive on the left side of a road, you can drive on the right side of a road, but you cannot do both. You have to decide on one standard. Right. And th that's uh, why it's so important that we get these negotiations forward. And here I find that diplomacy has a strong role to play. How would you describe the changes in German diplomacy just in the last, let's look at the last 10 years, because mm -hmm. it's really not fair to, to, to compare the, the Cold War, the old, even the end of yeah. the Cold War to, to present time. So in the last 10 years, how has your German diplomacy changed? Well, uh, the world has changed tremendously, tremendously since the fall of the wall. So this would take us back 25 years, a generation back. But what we have seen in these 25 years was globalization. Uh, borders came down, not only the borders that separated the East and the West, but also borders uh, between countries. And uh, the financial markets be became global. Um, uh, trade was replaced by production chains. So when you uh, look at a product made in Germany, and you know that Germany is so successful as an exporter on the world markets, um, then 50% of our exports were previously imported. So uh, you see that there are production chains emerging, and these production chains were made possible uh, because of two things. One, the, uh, the advancement of IT, of computer technology and, 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 and the global networks. And, and of course, the other, the introduction of free trade and, and free capital markets. So the, the, the whole way things are produced, uh, things are made, is changing. But it needs a certain rule book underpinning that. And uh, that's what modern days diplomacy has to look after. So how many embassies, consulates, and other diplomatic missions does Germany have around the world? Well, we have 153 embassies. We have uh, uh, 70 consulates on, on top of that. Uh, so altogether, it, it, we come to about uh, 230 representations around the world. And how many diplomats does Germany have? Um, the German Foreign Service has uh, or employs uh, 12,000 people. Half of them are local employees, and the other half are, are permanent uh, employees employees who rotate around the world. Every three years, usually, we change our, uh, our workplace and move around the world. Uh, so we are modern days gypsies. Um, and uh, I think it's something that most foreign services in the world do, and we are part of that. So what would be the number of, of German diplomats? Not the local employees, but German yeah. diplomats. Uh, 2,000 or more than 2,000? Yeah. Of, of the 6,000 employees who were part of this rotating system, right we would roughly have about 2,000 uh, who have diplomatic status. OK, so that would compare to about 8,000 US diplomats Probably. around the world, yeah. um, which uh, we can look at Germany, France, Britain, and, and the US is probably the countries with most mm -hmm. diplomats. What about the global mission of German diplomacy? You, so far, you've talked a lot about economics and business, or the uh, British ambassador, another Peter, who was here. Uh, recently talked about, the pro called it the prosperity agenda. Mm -hmm. So globally, then, would that apply also to German diplomacy, or are there other issues that I think that's a nice way to put it. Um, prosperity is a prerequisite for long-lasting peace. And uh, we in, in, in Germany certainly have the uh, preservation of peace uh, and human rights as the overall headline for our, for, for our work. Um, we, uh, we know that this is a very complex situation. Uh, there are almost 200 countries in the world. The numbers of countries are is increasing, by the, w by the way, over, over the last years. And, and uh, countries split up. Uh, the situation becomes uh, more and more controversial in many parts of the world. When you look around the world, sometimes I think that the world is on fire. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we had hoped that uh, this was the end of history, the end of the history of wars. 
But on the, on the opposite now we see that more and more countries become unstable, uh, become violators of human rights, uh, become bad investment locations for this, by the way. And uh, uh, growth in the, in, in the world is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is very limited to very few places only. So um, there is a, uh, there's an enormous, I think, a growing challenge on all of us to, uh, to, to make sure that peace, a long-lasting peace, is achieved through creating a just world, a, a prosperous world, and a world in which human rights are respected. So would you say that in the German Foreign Service, if you are an economic officer, or you specialize in economics, mm -hmm. then that's all you will do in your career? No. We, we make sure that we don't over-specialize. Okay. So uh, I was a, a cultural attaché in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a press spokesman in New Delhi. So, I so you should be an expert, but you should also know a little yeah. or a s enough about other areas so you can work. I think the worst that can happen to you is narrow-mindedness. Yeah, you must be open to, to, to other countries and to other fields of, 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 of your trade. And in terms of training, that's a topic that I care a lot about because um, training in the US Foreign Service isn't nearly mm. sufficient. Mm. And Germany is often given as an example, especially your initial training, when someone joins the foreign service, yes. the foreign office. The, the, how long is the, the training that people get today? Is it a year? Well, I went, uh, it, it has uh, variated, fluctuated a bit over time. But I had two years uh, diplomatic <laughs> school. One of the, years of, of the two years I spent in an academy, and one year on, on, the, on the job training, as a trainee, so to speak. Uh, but two years is quite a long time. Quite often when people come from university, they say, now we have spent the last five or six years learning things. We want to go into the middle of it and start working. But the second year is basically a rotation. You, you work in different sections of an embassy? Yeah. The you, same embassy, you go around? You would, you would stay in this in, in head headquarters in, in our foreign office and, 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 and move around the, uh, the foreign office. Oh, so you would not go to a, would an not embassy in abroad. other countries? You would not go abroad. So the first year is studying yeah. in, mm. a, in a classroom? Yes. And the, first yes. And the second year yeah. is really yeah. practical yeah. in a way. It's By the way, the, these classes are, are, are uh, quite, quite interesting because people bond. And, uh, that, and I know quite often that uh, people make jokes in our service how close we are. We say we are cl uh, almost family. Yeah? Right. Well, you know, even a year, if, if you know, two years, but the year is, the first year is the... the sort of uh, school type mm -hmm. um, preparation comparing to the six w weeks that uh, American diplomats get, it's mm -hmm. a lot more. But um, on the subject of what an embassy does, as um, I recently actually was in Germany for a week and, mm -hmm. and uh, gave lectures on diplomacy in five different cities, everywhere I went, I was asked the question about the NSA revelations, mm -hmm. the National Security Agency and, mm -hmm. and Edward Snowden. And I was asked the question in every city, how or will, do I, did I think this will affect the, Germ the US-German relationship? What, I'm sure you've been asked sin mm. that since mm. then. How do you answer this question? I think it came as a big disappointment to almost everybody. But on the other hand, I think we now have to move forward. There are uh, dark clouds on the diplomatic horizon when, you, when we look to Ukraine and Russia these days. So we have to move on. They're more important things. To, to well, worry yes, about. I, I think we, we both, both sides have, uh, have learned that uh, we have to rebuild trust. It's like in a marriage. Uh, the closer you are, the, the bigger the disappointment uh, if one of the partners fails on you. But both, both sides, uh, are, are, I think, are convinced that we have to rebuild trust and restore trust, and, and we are working on that. You know, what I said at the time was that I, you know, short term, there will be consequences or repercussions because you know it's in the news, it's out there. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think in the long term, because of all these issues that you talked about, whether Ukraine or China uh, or any instability in any part of the world, is probably more important than a little rub over 
I is think that what we, correct? What, what, I think what we, what, what we need to do and what we are doing is uh, uh, to converse about it. We have to discuss it. Uh, we don't have to do this in public. We do this uh, behind closed doors, but we do that. And uh, to, to, to remain at the example I have given to you, uh, we can't afford marriage, uh, the marriage to fail. Uh, this is too important. Uh, right, the relationship, right. a transatlantic relationship is extremely dear to us. It's extremely important. And I would say to both sides. Yeah. Just as we see how the world is changing, how new, uh, how new powers emerge, uh, the US needs good allies, and I think uh, we are among the best. From your impressions over the last several decades since you've been in the Foreign Service, do ordinary Germans know and understand what a diplomat does? Probably not. <laughs> um, at least I need to explain my uh, raison d'etre uh, mm -hmm. regularly. But I think uh, people know that uh, they cannot hide behind borders. Borders have become less important in, to, in today's world. What happens uh, far away from here, let's say in Afghanistan or in Iran or in Ukraine, will d directly affect their lives. So people know that there must be someone who is handling that. Uh, who, who you cannot say, or like America had, a, had periods of uh, isolationism, when you said that we have two oceans protecting us from all the evil uh, in the rest of the world. This is no longer true. Uh, the evil can come through a, uh, through a, through a uh, cable uh, and send you a bad software uh, from somewhere. So how do you then make the link between uh, what happens in Afghanistan and the lives of Germans? How are those lives affected by what happens in Afghanistan? Well, we went to Afghanistan as a, a sign of, uh, 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 of support for the US. We, uh, after 9-11, uh, Article 5 of NATO was invoked, and Germany said, we... we that is a common security item, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we stand uh, with our American partners, so we, we sent German troops there. Uh, Quite a high number of people lost their lives. Uh, we paid a uh, considerable uh, financial uh, price there. And now, after uh, uh, more than a decade, this war comes to an end. And sometimes I tell my American friends, look who is still with you there. Uh, we are among the, the very few of your allies who, who stay with you till the very end. That's the German way. We don't go out easily can rely on us. Right. You mentioned Ukraine. There is a uh, Russia-NATO council. There are various fora. There's the G8, where the West and Russia are trying to work together on various issues. From a German perspective, where do you see the relationship between the West and Russia in five or 10 years? I would say where would you like it to be? What, what, what's happening right now is very serious. I think we are. Uh, we find that uh, Russia is breaking international law. We cannot accept that. So, so we have been very clear on that. Um, could be that this is a turning point. I hope not. Um, since the fall of the Berlin Wall 25 years ago and the collapse of the Soviet Union afterwards, we had hoped that we could build a relationship with Russia which would mean integration in the global system. They would be a partner like everybody else. They would be wealthy through economic success. We wanted to help them, give them technology, access to markets. And uh, they would be a partner like everybody else. That was the, the, the hope. I hope that this, uh, this idea is not buried uh, today in, in Crimea. Well, do you think to get to that place you're talking about, where Russia would be a responsible partner in whether political, economic, other issues, that perhaps this will only happen with change of generations in terms of the leadership of that country? Well, we have seen progress in, in, in Russia over the last 20 years. We, Russia has changed a lot, and there is a uh, group of, I would say, uh, there's a young generation that, uh, that, that uh, adheres to Western lifestyles and Western ideas. So I would not give up hope com completely, but uh, what we try to, or what we must convey to the Russian side is that uh, 
it's in their own interest that they become part of, of the world of uh, free economies, democracy, civil rights, liberties, and all that. But um, as I'm sure you know, since you spent years as a diplomat under the Cold War, there's this thing about Russian mentality, at least the leadership of uh, mm. Russia, where it says this is the zero-sum game. Mm. Oh, if it's good for the West, it must be bad for us, mm -hmm. or the other way around. Mm -hmm. And they don't think that it could be a win-win for both sides. Mm -hmm. Do you still see elements of that? Well, uh, let me, let me uh, put it in a different way. I, I hope that uh, over the last years, more and more Russians uh, discovered that there can be a win-win situation. And uh, when you go to a, a restaurant in Moscow today, you, you get the same quality of food as you would get here in central Washington. Um, and uh, you would ha have the same t type of apartment, same lifestyle, discotheques, parties. I don't think that anybody in Russia wants to give this up. There was an impression that Germany was not willing to go as far as the US mm. in terms of sanctions against Russia over what it has been doing in Ukraine because the argument went that Germany would suffer due to the fact that it has a large amount of trade with Russia. Mm -hmm. Is that so? Um, thank you for asking, for asking that question because I'm, I'm, I really want to state here that our foreign policy is not driven by our uh, uh, trade relationship with Russia. The trade with Russia is only a small fraction of our total trade. To be precise, it's 2.7% of our exports go to Russia. Much less than the U.S. trade oh, relationship. Oh, this is just minimal. And uh, uh, occasionally people point to our dependency on, on on, on Russian gas. Uh, we used to buy 41% of our gas in 2002 from the Russians. Now we are at 36%, I think. Um, but uh, it is quite clear that the Russians are much more dependent on, the, on their income from these sales than we are on, on their supply. Russia has about 50% of its, uh, of, 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 of its uh, budget from uh, oil and gas sales. So they really depend on, on, on these markets. And uh, we don't see that, it, that, it, that they would play with a trigger here. Uh, we believe that uh, we understand it's in, uh, in their interest as it is in our interest not to, not to be uh, not reliable trading partners here. Throughout the Cold War, the Russians, uh, they did all kind of things. So, uh, but they never played with this card. All right. And, and finally, I hear you are a big Bob Dylan fan. <laughs> what in particular about his music and lyrics do you like? Of course, uh, um, I was told that, uh, or I read somewhere, that people uh, never forget the, mu the music they, they learn to love when they're in their teens and early twen twenties. So it was, this was, of course, of course my case. But uh, I love the lyrics in particular. I think he merits the Nobel Prize in <laughs> literature. And uh, what I did here in America when I gave public speeches on all kinds of things, I uh, clandestinely quoted Bob Dylan and watched the public if they realized that this was a quote or not. 50% of the cases they realized, 50% is not. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me, Nicholas. For more about our show or to make a contribution, the address is nicholaskraliff.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.